So now, I, I would like to oh. introduce our poet, <coughs> the reader for the evening, Noel, Noel Hanlon, who is back there. Noel is the author of a book of poems, Blue Abundance, published in 2010 by Salmon Poetry in the, the west of Ireland, a place she loves. I've learned in getting to know Noel that she lives, she spends some of her time in Ireland and some of the time in, in Oregon. She's born and raised in Portland, Oregon. She and her husband live in a small farm on the Willamette Valley where they have raised their children, chickens, lambs, vegetables, and so forth. Her poems have been widely published in such periodicals and magazines as the Texas Observer, Poetry Ireland Review, Mission at 10th, and then the anthology Dogs Singing. She's also served on the board of Soapstone. So we have wanted to have Noelle as a reader in the Milwaukee Poetry Series. She is here tonight. Would you join me in welcoming our poet for the evening, Noelle Hanlon. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I'd, I'd really like to thank the city of Milwaukee, Dogwood City of the West, and the Letting Library. It's a great honor to be able to read here this wonderful series. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize two people in the audience, Judith Barrington and Ruth Gundel, uh, and for all the work that they've done for writers. It was their beautiful vision and devoted muscle that created Flight of the Mind, where my desire to become a poet took root. For those of you who don't know about Flight of the Mind, it's sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Flight of the Mind was two weeks of writing workshops that brought together 60 or so women in each week from all walks of life together in the 1990s. Can you turn it off and I'll just yell? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> that Thank you. At the time that I first applied for Flight of the Mind, I had two young children I was raising and a farm to take care of, and I didn't know if I was a poet or not. I was lucky to be accepted into a workshop with Naomi Shiab Nye, whose inspiration and generosity encouraged me into believing that perhaps I was. So I thought I'd begin this reading with one of my favorite poems of hers called Kindness. But I also owed Judith a great depth of gratitude for inviting me into the phenomenal group of women writers I'm in now. Thank you. I read <clears throat> this poem, Kindness, um, in Ireland when I launched this Blue Abundance in April 2010 in Galway, Ireland. And, uh, Naomi Shiab Nye, by coincidence, was supposed to be there to be reading in the court festival there. <clears throat> but as you recall, there was a volcano in Iceland. And she couldn't get over, and she'd always been wanting to get to Ireland, and she couldn't get there. And somehow we got there in some moment where the volcano quieted. Um, so I read this for her. Kindness by Naomi Shiab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things, feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you. How he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, 
You must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread, only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. So good. Um, so I live on a farm, and I spend most of my days alone in solitude. That is really good for me, and it's where a lot of my poetry is um, dreamed of and seeded. And so I thought I'd start off with a few of my farm poems, give you a picture of where the poems come from and where they're grown. <coughs> Strength. Some days I carry my farm like a burden, a longing as unavoidable as death sweeps away what I hadn't known was peace until then, and I walk a wide circle around my happiness, study gravity, fallen branches, the bowed fence line. I've learned on days like these to move into my fields on peasant feet, to reach for the long rope of muscle running the length of arm and spine, to heave the work that needs to be done. I open the door to the pen where I've kept the lame ram, cut away the rotted hoof until blood runs and I'm sure I've reached living tissue. Released, he limps into light raises his head to the scent of green. And I bend, follow white threads, tenacious roots of morning glory, until my soil appears to gleam and I overhear a conversation full of seedlings uncurling inside their dark home. When night sifts back in, I know I could flick on false streams, could sort out through all that has come undone, but I don't. I open windows and let motes of dust like ghosts drift out. I find my hands, best friends, stained and cracked with love of earth at rest at last. I trust in the ancient walls that define my life and the infinite darkness falling into sight. Pretty new poem. I wrote from a prompt to write something where you're giving instructions. <clears throat> Pruning. Before you prune a tree, wait for the leaves to fall to see the bare bones of its form. Stand back from it many times to understand how it climbs towards light and know how it is balanced on its hidden roots. Always begin by taking out the dead and damaged wood, the rampant suckers of past prunings. Leave no sign of stub or stump, but cut cleanly along the natural flowing line of the remaining limb. Then walk around its circumference, taking in which branches cross and cutting those that interfere with the others, leaving the most graceful boughs to expose its symmetry. Take many years with a tree that has been neglected, slowly, never severely, opening, opening it again to light and air. Imagine a bird flying through it, said a man who makes his living in gardens. Well, you should choose your friends very wisely. We all know that. You should also choose your enemies wisely because you do a lot of thinking about them. <laughs> And 
this is as a farmer, my enemy, we had this conversation at dinner, is the gopher. <laughs> but there are many other things, and it seems it keeps changing, that the gopher's been there longer than the other things. As it is, beneath us, a maze of tunnels. You have to be patient to watch the quivering vegetables before they're tugged under and devoured. Mm -hmm. And above, intelligent eyes perch. Observe us until we leave, then swoop down to pull up the tear-shaped kernels when their first leaves emerge. Around us, our mountains have become elusive, weightless, their solid blue bases melting in the haze of pollution. Inside, a stack of books grows, open to the underlying wisdoms of those who live to work in gardens, reaping alongside that which is lost. Well, there's this very strange poem, and I have to apologize to vegetarians. It's a pretty new one. It's a couple of years old, but after the book. So for we usually trade um, room and uh, for work at our house during the summers when there's so much work. And at one point we had <clears throat> three people living there, two of them very close friends, and they all wanted pigs. And I didn't want pigs ever because I I like pigs and I'd heard they're really smart and very different than a flock of sheep that runs from you. So, but I let them do it and I said I wouldn't be involved. But of course, I got involved. <laughs> and there's a little quote here that a friend from mine in Ireland, when I sent her this poem, she sent back this by a man named Dennis Devlin. I don't know any of his writing. And it's, better beast and know your end and die than man with murderous angels in his head. Violet. The sun behind the western trees lights up the tail, hair, and ears of our pigs as they waddle back towards their shed. They are happy, I somehow know to tell, by the way they travel, not sensing my presence yet, living by their noses, thrilled with earth, what is underneath to be rooted out by glorious snout. Less than a week left in their lives, though they cannot know this yet, for now they meander, lit up by autumn's early evening, playfully stepping from scent to scent until they finally arrive at the place where my boots just came down over the turnstile. They lift their faces from the ground, searching, a myopic squinting, to discover me waiting there for them. They speak to me, their grunted greeting repeated as they quicken their pace, trotting toward me. I softly call their names and rub their stiff hair and flaking skin once they reach me. Violet hogs me, so mercy moves on to the water spigot and feeding trough. When I reach under Violet's great neck, she stretches out with effort on the cold ground, so I'll rub her belly and tiny rows of nipples where her pleasure intensifies. I love the great bulk of her own sort of beauty and personality, yet I will be eating her soon. <laughs> Not supposed to be funny. No thought can soothe this duplicity. <laughs> We always land on the same end lines. They had a happy life. They were kept kindly, loved even, died painlessly. It is as much as we can possibly settle for or hope for our own lives, whether or not God is our witness or shepherd, judging when our wonderful bodies have reached the limit of their life. After the slaughter, the fields are sad and quiet. I have chickens. I've always had chickens. Too many to count. And I think everybody should have chickens. They're very entertaining. <laughs> and they lay those magical things called eggs. 
milling about. The old rooster, having proclaimed too many times long before and after dawn, the sun has risen, switches to his other job on earth to tell the hens when he's found remnants of green in the scratched brown coop yard. And they, with their useless wings lifted, race to him with, his, with their hunger, answering, I'm coming, I'm hungry. The young rooster holds back. He knows to test his tiny red crown glory in the shadows of the coop, his tenuous crowing where the old rooster is not. And the Arakanas, wilder like grounded hawks, are silent, do not mingle with the hybrids, the red sex links, or the black and white lace wings. They choose the quiet instead, find the furthest corners of the coop to hide their jewels, their delicate blue-green eggs, while the brown and white layers squabble over who shall get the best, the warmest boxes to lay in. Indignant ruckuses erupt. Someone has pushed someone out of a broody nest. Someone is being henpecked, insulted, or assaulted. All the while, the kind old rooster continues searching for scraps, muttering promises with such undying hopefulness and devoted focus that the hen that the hens continue to mill around him. And then it will happen with some unseen tilt of hours in his eyes, he cries out, daylight's going. One by one, they straggle back and coop long before night, as if sunlight makes sound safe. While it drops, they gather into a silence, except for the thump of talons clamping on roost beams or the whoosh of settling domesticated wings. There is only the murmuring, as close as chickens ever come to singing of peace. <laughs> well, I think raising children with my loving husband of many years is my greatest creative act. So I'm going to read a few poems about my children. And I, I really treasure the poems that I've written about them because better than a photograph, it, for me it caught some moment that was happening and changing at the same time. Paul. My son is made from air. Conceived under a piano at noon, he arrived in absolute peace without the usual cry after his first breath. I held him like loss, afraid I could ruin him. When he was three, I kissed his stillness as he slept and he said through fluttering eyes, it does not take so long to become a man in this world. And I said, yes, softly, as if there was someone else in the room, I thought so. At 10, he disappeared on the continental divide, east falling from west, when for a moment we couldn't keep up. A strange line of strangers trudging through snow in tennis shoes said they had seen him following mountain goats. Goat boy. His room, his choice, is the deep blue of dawn. You can't stay in it, or dusk, and filled with tiny accessories small plastic men who do good. At age 11, I catch him in costume, but he freezes, acts natural, and invites me to sit down while he changes back into boy again. His lips are the softest, fullest that have ever met mine. He slips his hand into my hand in a crowd. How did I think about men before him? His father now cries when he does. His grandmother cannot see him. In the filtered light of his sister's shadow, he will always be smaller, never outshiner. He balances our world from his deep blue room with his wall of hats. <clears throat> and this was the threshold moment when he was about to leave home. 
relinquishing time. Waiting at the gate to your summer, the air was sweet with thrush and hemlock. We looked into our same green eyes, smiling, and gazed away into the darker green understory. I believed while I carried you in me you would arrive a girl, so when I held a boy I was surprised, never dreaming you could come to be so like me. One night last winter I watched you drive off a little too fast for comfort, red taillights beacon diminished by the distance speeding across the black horizon line. Above you a full moon rose partially eclipsed, rare moments when our own planet's shadow illuminates just how slowly but surely we ourselves are turning. When he first <clears throat> heard me read that, he was standing next to an aunt who turned to him and said, driving too fast. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it's a metaphor. <laughs> this is for my daughter, Mara, on her 13th birthday. In the oven heat of a secret canyon, we cross the anxious creek to cool. You reach back to steady me, and your new sprung strength opens our eyes. Our footprints, as we struggle out the other side, burn off quickly, wet black, into silent white stone. Mock orange ignites like girls' perfume, and underneath it, crushed sage in the pinched air carries me back to my first passion, your father in high desert. Away from my valley garden, I feel your age, the agony inside your beauty. Like me, you need something to push against. We bleed on opposite sides of the moon. Yours waxing, you pace with claws and growl while I calmly plant leaf crops beyond you. Your lithe hips let the current move around you. Your small breasts ache inside the long wait no longer satisfied in the large yard of my hug. Now, when you come to be held, we rest our heads on the other's shoulder. How fragile your skull at birth, two days fighting the tight fist of my cervix. In your skin, clear from darkness, I saw blue veins leading to your heart. And there's her threshold moment of leaving was is your um, the beautiful broadside they've made here and when she first read this poem she responded mama you won't break my wings <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's window <clears throat> While you were gone, I came into your room and heard a desperate thrumming coming from inside your diaphanous purple curtains. It was a hummingbird pinned between two panes of glass in your open window. One wing caught upwards, the other furiously beating. My heart sped to her, though I froze, terrified that in trying to free her, I'd break her tiny wings. Yet once I began to weave my hands beneath her, she stilled until I aimed her at open space and she vanished as an arrow freed in the green wilderness. She came back, though. She got <laughs> Valentine's I, um, Ted Kusner does these little or did little series of Valentine postcards um, and so I tried one and did a Valentine for children 
You were once the seed of idea, inklings in the hidden heart of us, the fragile slip of dream in our young bodies. What did we know? A sliver of light in clear darkness, time's shadow blinds the whole. But when at last you were born, the love you were made from grew visible and ever deeper. I've known my husband Peter for many years, but um, since we were 14, <laughs> this poem is about us. The Garden Fence. When you leaned on the fence and I on my shovel, where I had been unearthing the hidden stores of potatoes, you said you were in love with light, and I thought you said you were in love with life, and I agreed that I was too. As, as we spoke, every word made sense for what we thought the other was saying. Each, each with our own idea, each so intricately entwined as we are. And when I realized our mistake, I had to laugh at how like our conversation across the fence, our love works. <laughs> um, somebody in my group asked, in a writing group, asked me to, or asked us to write an obod, and I'd never heard of one, but when I looked it up, it was in my understanding, traditionally, two lovers leaving each other at dawn. And so since I don't have a lover to leave at dawn, <laughs> I, had to, I had to think about what, what would be like stealing away from Peter and one of my loves in life is to go off under the stars. Um, and we, we find them up on Mount Adams a lot of the time. So I wrote this, and then the funny thing was when I brought it back to the group, so I kind of wrote it as if I was stealing away with the stars and came back to Peter at dawn. <laughs> the group said, you did it backwards. You came to him at dawn. You didn't leave him at dawn. <laughs> Probably shouldn't call it an obot, but that's its name. I had waited with growing hunger <clears throat> to return to a remote mountain, waited for the road to open, to be under a new moon with the celestial multitudes coming true. And I waited a few more minutes for all trace of daylight to die away, to slip my boat into the invisible lake. My face tipped back as if to kiss something more lasting than desire while other fires died out around the body of water reflecting pure firmament. I was suspended above and beneath stars inside a night where quiet deepened. I was out there as far from our life as the hereafter, save three candles keeping watch from a lantern, small lighthouse on the place of shore where you had fallen asleep sound in your feeling that I wouldn't drown, but we would return secured in your arms again before dawn broke the summit in brilliant white descent, and in its wake return to the meadows all the colors of wildflowers we have yet to name. So this book, Blue Abundance, um, is dedicated to a man named John O'Donohue, who some of you might know his, his work. And he was a good friend of mine. It was one of the deepest friendships I think I should ever expect in life. And he's a wildly alive person and a laughter I'll never forget. And uh, he's written many books couple of poetry and some philosophies and um, 
I would really recommend that you look him up, his writing, if you haven't. Um, but he died suddenly, he's my age, and died suddenly, and um, really uh, sent me sideways. And he was the one got me to get a manuscript together, so I was halfway through pulling this book together to be published when he died. So there's a few grief poems in here as I worked away to pull it. And this one is um, in memory of him. He died in January, and I found that as spring came on, it just felt like it went so against grief. Um, he loved Meister Eckhart, so there's a little quote here that he had actually sent to me. Stand still and do not waver from your emptiness, for at this time you can turn away, never to turn back again. Too soon. In the bleak dream that is February's, I will myself to face this wilderness I've inherited by your leaving us, hoping to still find something of you here. Inside the gray hills of sky, a heaving, and in the emptying of breath, a thrill, leaning as I am with all my senses toward a nothingness that calls you nearer. But spring begins to till the dark I need for grieving my loss with a thoroughness. And through the chill of distance, moss, lichen, the budded reaching of red branch assume colors and light you loved. The living world reaches for me, bereaved of you too soon. One of the hardest things, I think, is to lose a friend who's still living. So I wrote a prose poem exploring that idea. Without. When a friendship dies, whether suddenly or glacially, the earth begins, the earth beneath me doubts itself. Whole days begin and depart without the kindness of an explanation and dreams solve nothing. My oldest friend's silence is also lost in a din of questions I will not write or send. Held in suspension, where the future withers on the vine of now and the past comes back in a different light, absent of laughter. If there was love, where is it buried? It continues unfinished. When a friend dies, I know what they've left behind. Their love and thoughts live through my heart and mind. Beauty comes alive vividly in the face of grief on a child a trough of cold well water where I float naked in light like broken glass, the way a swallow negotiates emptiness, facing the waves, knowing each breath is forgotten in the next until the last. I know just where I stand. The rest of my life begins without. Well. Um, I think I'll close. Oh, I wanted to read you John's, one of John's poems. I forgot. He wrote this poem a long time ago. He has a newer book of poems called Connemara Blues. This one's called Echoes of Memory. And uh, he wrote this poem for his mother. And I wanted to read you this. He was, he, this just to give you an idea of what kind of person he was. He'd call all the time just to check in, like he would have called today at three to see how I was doing, getting ready for the reading. Mm -hmm. But um, one time we had a great conversation, and he got off the phone. So he lives in Ireland, right? So it's a long ways away. So he writes me an email almost immediately. It says, it was so lovely to talk with you. Isn't there something in the sound of the voice, too? 
maybe before there were people, there were just voices. And then they were so promising that they let the voices do what they loved, and they filled up as separate worlds we call people. Isn't that great? So this is a poem. A lot of people may have heard this already, because it's kind of traveled around the world, I think, via internet. Um, it's called Benacht, and that's blessing in Irish. And there's one other Irish word in there, Curruck, which is kind of an uh, American canoe, a canoe maybe, a, but it's an Irish boat, small boat. Benacht, for Josie, my mother. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azer blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curric of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Because of this reading, I, a newer poem of mine called Leaving Winter found a home in the Oregonian. So thank you once again, Milwaukee. Um, and I'll close with this poem. Leaving Winter for Brendan. This morning halted beneath the golden trees to listen to a meadow lark pouring, pouring out its liquid song. And for a moment, all the dying and missing following me stopped. Even the scrub jays paused their rasping talk, and the blue sky fell into my eyes, and the greening field rose up again. Thank you. Definitely Judith and uh, Naomi Shebnai, um, William Stafford. I've really fallen in love with W.S. Merwin and um, Lee Young Lee and um, Mark Strand. And I love Jane Hirschfield. Let's see, where to stop? <laughs> I think they all would influence you if you read them enough, yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? Are you, so what connects you to Ireland so strongly? Um, well, I'm 100% Irish. <laughs> born in, born in? No, my, my great grandparents came over. I, um, but I, in the middle of my life, when I had little kids, I went with, um, which was very unlike me, I went on a, gr in a group excursion to see Ireland. I had always wanted to see it. Um, and I went with a poet, David White, and on his trip there, he brought in the poet John O'Donohue. That's how I met him. We became very good friends. And then he started a tour over there in Ireland. And uh, he would fly me over to drive the van of mystics around. <laughs> so no wonder. <laughs> yeah, it's been wonderful. Have you 
you been? I haven't been, but uh, I'm not saying I won't. Okay. <laughs> That's good. So <laughs> I have one other question. Uh, you have a lot of strong last lines. Hmm. And have you ever gotten a last line first that you built something on so that you could say that? No. No. No, it's more the discovery of where As the poem was going, yeah. Is yes. that Irish or Welsh? Irish. Irish. Uh, because I'm Welsh. Irish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the eyebrows. <laughs> the barbers always ask me, you want me to trim those eyebrows? And I say no. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like big eyebrows. <laughs> My husband's always trying to tell his hairdresser to stop it. <laughs> yes? Hi, um, I would love to hear about what you have to say about how poets and poetry are regarded in Ireland and your experience with that since you're living there so I just wonder how that goes. Well, I am so impressed that most, definitely it could be being lost in this next generation because of American TV and everything else. but. Everybody my age knows how to go into a poem, recite a poem all night long. You could sit down and people just throw out the poems and the songs, and it's in their life, it seems to you now. I know that's a generalization, but I'm sure it was schooling, but it, there's also a real joy to it, having that in you and what you can share and throw out around a, a fire. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no more questions, Noelle is going to be here for a while, and she has books here to sell. Thank you very Thank much. You, Tom. Thank you.